So I have one announcement before we begin, and that is that Jeff Halper is uh, the chair of something called the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. And uh, they go around blocking the demolition of houses and rebuilding houses that have been demolished. So he will be speaking in San Francisco on Monday at the First Unitarian Universalist Center on Franklin and Geary. Um, it's, um, it's kind of an interesting project that for us to think about. I I'm thinking of creating a new category called Obstructo Constructive Program. Uh, what, uh, what they do and what some other groups do, this uh, uh, actually another group I want to tell you about in a second, is they go and rebuild houses that are uh, knocked down and then the Israelis come and knock them down again and they rebuild them again. And it's an interesting approach. It shows, of course, tremendous amount of determination um, to do something like that. It's, it's completely constructive. Um, my only uh, – the only reason I'm hemming and hawing here, my only hesitation is on the level of efficiency. Like I remember when Mubarak Awad was beginning the intifada, the first intifada. He wasn't the only one, but he was involved in it. One of the things they looked at was how efficient the Israeli occupation was, that one IDF soldier could control five villages. And they said, one of the things that we can do is make this harder for them and to start being obstreperous and hanging out the flag. All you need to do is display the Palestinian flag and they have to come and rip it down or bash down the wall if you painted it on a wall or something. So what they were able to do in a very short period of time was make the occupation drastically more expensive. And it's something we haven't mentioned yet, but it is a consideration that one of the things that you do in nonviolence – is, uh, is make it harder for your oppressor to oppress you. It's just on, on any level. So that's, that's rain – oh my only – it's really just a feeling of grief rather than an objection about these people who are going out there. It's like Milarepa, you know, being sent out there to build a house for your guru and then he says he wants it moved over to the other side of the hill. Then you've got to move it somewhere else. It's sort of Milarepa without the good karma. I guess. Um, is rebuilding a house is a lot harder than tearing one down. So that, that's my only objection. But it's an incredible project and it's, it's that project, Rebuilding Alliance, which is doing the phone call next Wednesday. And I'm going to try and – I've asked them to give me the number so I can give it all to you. But I'm – if I fail to do that, you can probably get it on their website, rebuildingalliance.org. And then the third operation I want to mention for us to just have an eye open for – and I'm sorry, I don't – I couldn't quite remember the website, which I was told last night, but there were about 150 people milling around and I was in a state anyway. <laughs> but there is a group that is planning to break the illegal blockade of Gaza by starting a flotilla of ships that will be – actually they're starting from Cairo probably, but then they'll be regrouping and joining others in Cyprus. And they're just playing going in to Gaza and Meta has been consulting with them about what they should have, what they should not have. Originally they were going to try to bring humanitarian aid because that's nice and squeaky clean and it makes the Israelis look bad if they block it. But what they were really trying to do is to get some people, some Palestinians back in there who were not – allowed in. So we counseled them to do one or the other. You know, this nonviolence as conversation. You want to keep it one-pointed and clean. If you're doing humanitarian aid, which we did not advise because it's not necessary, the Israelis do a lot of that anyway, just do that. But if you really – if you want to bring in people that they don't want in that area, make that the issue. And don't pretend you're bringing in humanitarian aid. Anyway, it's an extremely interesting project that's getting launched. Um, I forget when exactly later on in the summer. So that's uh, an obstructive program going on. And mm -hmm. another one to keep in mind is the one that you probably mm -hmm. heard on that w uh, webcast radio interview with Jack Duval, which is a very interesting uprising that has started in the Maldives, these islands off the coast of India which I guess are politically independent. They've been ruled very uh, despotically 
for quite some time and the people are starting to raise up and say we don't want despotism anymore. So it really is like I sang in the song last night. It really is popping up all over the world. <laughs> that was the high point, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, just you know, because the, our class is coming to an end, I thought I'd like to start mentioning things that are going on around the world to sort of keep your radar tuned to. Um, the I want to say a little bit about uh, the presentation that we had last time on nonviolent communication, which has been a very, very successful piece of the action. So we want to ask ourselves, what piece is it? How does it fit in? What does it do? What's left to do elsewhere? And then basically, I'm slowing down in terms of presenting new material from here on out because I feel enough already. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you won't get it covered no matter what you do. Even if I were from Chicago and I talked nonstop for six hours, we still wouldn't get it all covered. Um, and leave plenty of time for questions and stuff. And another reason that I'm slowing down is we're now approaching a very difficult subject to come to grips with, and that is culture. It's hard to talk about because we are in it. You know, it's hard to talk about the woodwork that you're in. I mean, it's very clear to me some of the dimensions of what's wrong with the present culture and what we're going to need to have in the new one are very, very clear. But the process of how you create a culture and get it adopted has never been clear. Kind of mysterious. And it has never been clear even before we got to the information age. Okay. So here's my agenda, unless you people want to do something else. I'll talk a little bit about uh, Mickey Kashtan's presentation, a few loose ends about what we said about organization, and then start talking about culture, however one talks about that. Okay. So here's one, one of the things that I wanted to take out of Mickey's talk was her definition of peace because it is complementary to my definition and sort of interesting to put them side by side. And we should put them side by side, not one on top of the other, okay? <laughs> so uh, my definition, which possibly you never even heard because I think I only mentioned it in, <coughs> in A, is that peace obtains in a, in a system where all parties spontaneously desire one another's welfare. That covers a lot. So the spontaneously means that it's gotten to be Breed, it really is what you want. It's not just – it's not something that you're forcing yourself to work on anymore. You may start out that way. But when you come to feel really that the other person's happiness is important to you and you're going to work on it – and we're not saying yet that it's more important than your own. We're not saying anything yet about the relationship of your fulfillment to the other person's fulfillment. Which, which follows pretty naturally. I mean, if you really, really deeply believe that your fulfillment is contrary to and in competition with somebody else's, you will not be able to get to this state because nobody can stop seeking for their own happiness. We're just sort of wound up to do that. All life is doing that. We get pretty stupid about where it's going to be coming from, but we're all seeking it no matter what. The Buddha said that. So. Uh, I have just now taken a very simple st sentence and made it into a very complicated one. It's called being a professor. <laughs> Let's go back and do it in the simple version. I any social group in which all parties are interested in the other's happiness is at peace. Any other problems that come up, they will be able to work out based on that understanding. Okay? Now her definition was – a place where all parties can hold all their needs. As you can be aware of what you really need and you can let the other person be aware of what he or she really needs and that's peace. It strikes me that these definitions are quite complementary. You know, I have absolutely no problem with hers and I don't think she'd have a problem with mine. If she did, I would just put on my best New York accent and say, what, you got some kind of problem with that? <laughs> But that has never happened <laughs> between me and Mickey. So it's interesting because it's kind of typical of what's happening now with this groping for a new world order and a new culture is that different people are coming up with different pieces of it. And we sense that they are in sync, you know, that they resonate with one another, but very 
few people have been able to sit back and say, oh, I see the whole picture and this is where your piece fits in and it's actually just a different version of Michael's piece. We're looking at it from a different angle. That's the part that's really missing is to see the whole thing clearly enough that you can start positioning the different parts. But right now we have hundreds and hundreds of parts and they're just beautiful. All kinds of different parts. I've got a, uh, a file uh, back home on my computer called Flowers. It's from this thing, a Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom. And every time I hear about one of these neat things, I just throw it on there. And it's just going to be this huge long list. <coughs> be incoherently beautiful at this point. At some point though, it does have to be reduced to a formulation that you can grasp with your mind. Um, and then she went on to say that when this happens, amazing creativity is unleashed. I, I really like that idea. Amazing creativity is unleashed. That's what you were talking about yesterday, Zoe, in your talk. Around the joint uh, strategies to meet these needs. Now, when I heard that, this seemed to me to be uh, an ideal case, a very effective case of a principle that was discovered by a couple of sociologists, a uh, married couple actually, Una Pareja. His last name was Sharif. So there is a book by Sharif and Sharif called In Common Predicament. And this is about an experiment that took place in a camp in Canada where they first decided to see if they could create hostility among the campers. A stupid idea if I ever heard one, but um, it turned out that guess what? It was not hard to do that at all. They divided them absolutely arbitrarily into two groups that were called absolutely arbitrary symbolic things like you be the eagles, you be the something else. I, have I told you this before? Okay. And in a short period of time, these two groups of children, young people, they would not eat at the same table. They wouldn't play with one another. They started short sheeting each other the things that you do at camp. Uh, I'm not sure I even remember how to do that. <coughs> and uh, it got worse and worse and it was starting to be serious. I mean real fights and real conflict. So it turned out that, okay, that part of the experiment was concluded and it came to a successful conclusion. It is very easy to get human groups to be hostile to one another. All you have to do is say, hey, there's a difference and bang, off they go. This is not all human groups. We're talking about human groups that come from an urban industrialized setting in the modern West. Did you have a question, Janelle? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So it was a little bit more serious than that. Okay. So my completely cynical interpretation is maybe not justified. Um, but nonetheless, it is strikingly a model for what happens in adult human groups at the built up level. I mean, look at the Balkans, look at uh, Uganda, I mean Rwanda, but you could also look at Uganda, <laughs> look almost anywhere. And you'll see this. Arbitrary differences, especially when resources are involved. And this is what Jared Diamond has pointed out in his book, Collapse. Uh, but not only then, uh, the hostilities are pretty easy to polarize. So then comes the next part of the experiment, which is how do we get these people back together? And they tried various things. They tried having us all go to movies together and they, they actually thought that this would be very effective. It was not. They had them play games together. They had them eat together. Nothing really worked. So Janelle, do you want to tell us what finally did it? Yes, the broken down truck. I forget whether this was one of the created problems or was an actual problem. An actual problem, thank you. They had to get into town to get something and the truck broke down and it needed everybody's resources to fix it. And they noticed that the groups were much more cordial after they had worked on the truck together. So they said, hmm, sociologists say that a lot. Hmm, they said. Maybe something is going on here. And they started creating problems like, oh, the well isn't working. Who knows about electric motors and ropes and pulleys and stuff like that? 
And so they did a few more of these things and they found in a really an encouragingly short period of time the groups got back together and the differences were pretty much forgotten. It was a very useful finding. Uh, reconciliation uh, and other forms of amity and community building seems like they happen most effectively around common projects. Hang on just one second, Mike. So here we have a common project which is more or less the reconciliation itself uh, and you know, the, the joint meeting of needs. It strikes me that this thing that Mickey was describing would be like the most effective kind of joint project to bring groups back together again or strengthen bonds, which is say, I'm interested in your needs, you're interested in mine. I no longer define my needs as in competition with yours and vice versa. Once you can reach that point, you know, conflict is pretty much arbitrary and outgoing. Yeah? Did they break down those arbitrary groups? Which part of the uh, well, you'd have to read the book. I don't remember. I, uh, the only thing that I remember is that it got, it got past the hostility very quickly. But it would be interesting to know, could they then still retain their group loyalties and not define them in a negative way? Like, you know, hi, I'm a blue. Oh, you're a green. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I guess I ended that study mm -hmm. after they did all these, uh -huh. uh, I don't know, some, it's called some kind of goals, like that both groups have to work together to get to a certain goal. Uh -huh. um, at the beginning of the study, one group had gotten like some money for doing one task. That's trouble. But when they went home on the buses, they took a stop and that person like bought everyone ice cream cones with the money. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Spontaneously, you mean? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. All right, was there anything else that uh, from the presentation about nonviolent communication? And incidentally, they do a lot of trainings in this area. Bay Area is one of the bigger worldwide nonviolent communication center, and they are worldwide. Matthias? I, I, I found it worth reading in the um, Barrage training. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. School is such a competitive place, and you know, our families are not very good. Yeah. Yeah. Mhm. Seeing a room packed where you know one to four hundred people, everybody struggling with the same thing, one by one bringing in an example and and coming up and and working it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I think the strongest part of their work is how they're able to put you on a different footing where the differences that you have with another person become problems to solve. And that's all you need to do then. And especially if you can work those problems out together so the process itself is bonding. And implicit in what she was saying, no, explicit in what she was saying, very much like where we started in 164A, that there is no such thing as an irresolvable conflict that can only be, only come to a win-lose conclusion. There is no such thing. You just have to stop believing in it. And it, you can build it up from the smallest one-on-one -on -one confrontation, as you, Matthias was just saying, to the biggest problems in the world. And that's why I keep bringing up this little discovery little big discovery of Johann Galtung that the, the clash of civilizations is because the West needs access to their oil reserves and they need respect for their religion. So where's the conflict? You know, if we would just get down, get our egos out of the way and get down to the point where we recognize that, I think anybody with a third grade education, not beyond, but up to <laughs> a third grade education should be able to solve that. Yeah, so it, it, it is awesome and I think uh, I in, at lunch afterwards, I asked Mickey what the trainings really were, and she said it is not too different from what she was doing here with us. Just getting us to the point where we recognize what our needs are. And then the second part of that, which you began with, Matthias, was once you do that, it really is shocking to take a look at your culture and see how it is preparing you to be in conflict always. Yeah. Just uh, like 
Like the Kaiser said, we do not want, we do not desire war, we only desire victory. So if you go around desiring victory all the time, you're going to be in perpetual conflict. That's the only way you're going to get there. Yeah, so that was very good. And it would be interesting to compare. I'm not proposing we could maybe finish it now, but be thinking about this. Uh, what piece of the action is this? They do primarily training. They don't do much theoretical work. They figure they, they know what they need to know. Uh, and as far as that goes, you know, they're probably correct for the work that they're doing. And what they try to do is train people to think in that way so that they can implement those insights. Then you have something like the ruckus society on the other extreme, which is teaching you how to rope your way up a building and what to say to the police when they arrest you. Uh, and then you have, well, groups like mine, META, and I was very happy to see all of you there last night. It was very, that was a lot of fun. I haven't got to play a whole lot more Jesus for a long time. <laughs> and um, what we do is, uh, again, there's almost no overlap between what we do and what nonviolent communication does. We do almost no training. And we do – we try to study and conceptualize what nonviolence is and get it into different packages and deliveries that people can benefit from it. The now famous formula of inspiration, education, and support. So – and other groups too that you look at, you know, victim offender reconciliation programs. And in a minute we're going to be talking about truth and reconciliation stuff. Um, just start thinking about – I don't know, there must be some computer program which allows you to conceptually map the entire universe <laughs> and put different pieces in in different colors and different levels and stuff. Uh, it's a very important project. Be thinking when you're doing this about the model th of Joanna Macy's that I've shared earlier where she says we need to do three things basically. It's kind of a triage if you will. We need to stop the worst of the damage. Pretty, that would be pretty much our obstructive program. We need to create alternatives, which would be pretty much our constructive program. And then we need the cognitive work, which we're trying to address now here in why are we trying to do this? What is the meaning of it all? How does it fit in? And so forth. And she divided cognitive very wisely, I think, into – I'm forgetting now which term – what terms she used. It was something else. She was looking at culture, I think, and she divided it into cognitive and spiritual. So I, I think those are very useful categories and I'd like to see her put nonviolence at the center of it. Yeah. But that's between me and her. Yeah, with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. It will probably be a small meditation retreat for her because she went to one in Sri Lanka a couple of years ago that had 600,000 people. She said it was the most awesome experience of her life. 600,000 people meditating in one place. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Michael? Uh, yeah, just, just jump down. Uh, so we were talking about how – actions get organized and how spontaneous forms of organization are arising. And I wanted to mention something uh, that I hardly touched on, partly because of my age group, which is the new technologies. Uh, some people think this is going to change everything. And when they first started coming in, I remember the excitement with which a very intelligent person like Hazel Henderson, a self-taught economist who wrote a book called uh, Paradigm Regained. It's a very obvious title. I'd even thought of that title myself, but uh, you have to actually write the book. That's where I slowed down. Um, she was saying that now that we have computers, we don't need to have el regular elections anymore. Everybody can just vote from their home computer and it will be absolutely populist. There will be no electoral college. That, could you do that with a less squeaky kind of truck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not violent. You can do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Matthias. Um, so that was, this is not the first time here in the West that people have gotten extremely enthusiastic about a new technology only to find that there are shortcomings when 
atomic energy was discovered. There were real scientists who went public saying that on five cents worth of energy, you're going to be able to send an ocean liner across the ocean and back. Uh, it really looked like you know, we had gotten the key and it was, was going to be that simple. Um, so uh, this is prelude to saying that there are those who think that now that we have the internet, uh, a lot of these problems are going to solve automatically. I, as you can tell, I'm not totally persuaded because right? I don't think the problem is entirely a question of who's talking. I think it also matters what they have to say. Um, I have been impressed with how well certain things work like Wikipedia. I mean, think someone like me, coming from my background, spent half my parents' money getting a PhD so that I could be an expert in a subject. It's not a subject that anyone cared about, it turned out, but uh, anyway, <laughs> an expert. Then, you know, somebody else came along and said they knew something about that subject. Man, I would just slap them down. That was part of the whole game. But now suddenly you have Wikipedia, and I thought, you know, this thing will never work. No, no valid information will go up there, and you'll never know. But it turned out that even experts can be wrong. Uh, yes, I say this. I know I'm a traitor to my class when I say it. And um, George Bernard Shaw said that there are some subjects about which you can learn more from the man on the street than you can from an expert in that area. Because there's a funny thing about expertise. It somehow tracks you into smaller and smaller compartments until you can't see where your thing fits in anymore. And then as Socrates pointed out, you may know how to make a shoelace, but you won't know why you're putting your shoes on. For that, you need a philosopher. So it remains to be seen, but there are already some encouraging things that have happened. And I'm, you, even way back in the early 80s when the uh, Tiananmen Square disaster happened, the fact that people had fax machines meant that that massacre was much more public. <coughs> and in fact, we don't just have to be theoretical about this because the massacre of the students in Rangoon happened a year before. In fact, it's said that the Chinese regime was watching <coughs> that very carefully. And when they saw that you can massacre students and get away with it, uh, it removed the last of their inhibition. They're moving against their people in Tiananmen. But be that as it may, nobody knew about what happened in Rangoon. I mean, if I hadn't stumbled on that movie, I think I probably wouldn't know about it. The movie, namely, Beyond Rangoon. But that was just one year before, and the difference was there were no fax machines. However, if you have a regime that's um, enclaved into itself the way the Chinese regime is, it doesn't make that much difference to get the word out on the political strategy level. As we know, because we've mentioned it several times from direct testimony from people who are involved in drastic situations, on another level, it matters a lot whether people know that you're suffering. But on the strategic level, it actually doesn't seem to have helped that much. But on the other hand, you have these cr incredibly populist things happening. I remember for this, this is absolutely the first in my whole long experience in the peace movement. A group wanted <coughs> Uh, to run a full page ad in the New York Times, something simple like impeaching the president and the vice president or something like that anybody could go along with. It was a no brainer. Uh, in the morning, they sent out an appeal we need to raise $600,000 by such and such a time. Please, please send us money. That happens like, you know, three, four times a day. I get messages like that for the last all these many years. Four hours later, we got another message saying, okay, folks, that's it. Thanks. We got all the money. Now, that has never happened before in my entire history of activism. So there's no question that there is a way of contacting like-minded people very quickly. And very quickly is important in the modern age, you know, because it's, no, it's no longer the case where if we want to send a letter back to London, we have to put it on a packet boat and it'll take about eight weeks to get there, <laughs> you know. So we do have to move quickly sometimes. But – the negative side of it, it seems to me, is that these are impersonal groups. These, these, are, these are virtual communities. And yes, human beings have very active imaginations. These virtual things can be important. But on some level, I think we need to be in the same room with one another to be a real community. I had a 
student who was interning with me who got very interested in Dennis Kucinich when he was making his first run for president. And he, had, he was at a meeting. She went to hear him. She followed him out. And he was racing around. If, you, if you're running for president, that you're really running. I mean, I saw him one time in San Francisco. He was talking to us between about 9 and 11 p.m. And I said, where are you spending the night? He, and he said, on United Airlines. I have to give a talk in Maine tomorrow morning. So that's how it was with him. He ran out of the meeting and uh, my student followed him out and said, I want to intern with you. And he said, okay, why don't you send me an email, he said, without turning around. And she said, because I want to look you in the eye first. He stopped dead. He turned around. It was, just, it was a little bit odd because you've, you know Dennis Kucinich. You know, he's like about up to here on me. <laughs> well, she was, she's 5'11 and a half, I think. So he turned around and looked up at her. And they made eye contact, and he worked for, she worked for him for two years. And I think that's sort of typical of the way people like us think and operate, that there has to be some kind of human contact. And obviously, in a nation state with close to 300 million people, that isn't going to happen with everybody. But we need to build up to it from personal communications in some way. So although I've told you this before, let me, let me run by you one more time. Uh, Gandhi's model for how to organize the world. It's called oceanic circles. And uh, I'm sorry, I have switched to a different concept of, quote, organization than we were talking about earlier. We, we were talking earlier about organizing actions and movements. Here we're talking about a more static concept of how to organize the world. He, his model was you, we have to get away from the pyramidal structure that we're in where things are hierarchical. And they don't work. We were just uh, – Amy and I were just – when we were starting this latte a while ago, uh, we were hearing from our friend Mansura, who was talking about somebody who worked in the World Bank for 20 years. And he's now started his own nonprofit. And he said, I, I know this system inside and out. I've tried and tried to make it work. I'm here to tell you it does not work. This, this is the really stark fact that we have to face. The big organizations do not work. And I'm afraid that includes universities. And I don't know if that means that we have to you know, dismantle them. Do we reform them? Do we, rebuild al do we build alternatives, ignore them? I'm not sure where we go from here. But as to use his language, we have to build it offline and then you know, hope that there'll be some kind of accommodation. So anyway, here's, here was Gandhi's approach. Uh, you you want to start from the individual. That's the whole thing. That's where all of these systems have gone wrong. And you want to start from natural bonds and expand them – extend them, excuse me, not expand them. You have to expand them or extend them R rather than creating a structure de novo. You know, it does no relationship to anything and then give it the power to impose values on the natural group, which is what television is. So his model was the individual serves the village, the village serves the district, the district serves the state, like state within the country, Kerala, for example. The state serves the nation and the nation serves the world. And that way the power <laughs> is flowing outward, if you will, from the, the most basic unit, the real psycho-neurobiological unit of the human individual, out to the world and not the other way around. So then he said you would have a circle which embraces everybody and does not uh, dominate anybody. Now the key, of course, is in that world – in the word service. That you're capturing that service energy to run the world on rather than the exploitation energy to run the world on. The, the, the trickle-down theory, which is trickle-up in practice, as we've often mentioned. Okay. So I'm just sort of <coughs> leapfrogging from point to point here, so you know, fill in any time you want to. I'm going to share another interesting concept with you that came from Paul Hawkins, who's a well-known grassroots economist in the model of – in the uh, in the line of um, E.F. Schumacher and Hazel Henderson, who I just mentioned. In other words, 
someone who never got formal economic training, so he came out of it with his mind intact and could think about what really happens around material resources. I, I realize I have now dissed every field <laughs> in the world except my own. I'll get around to that next week. Um, but he was talking about this incredible expansion of NGOs. Now, if you talk even in terms of NGOs, non-governmental organizations that have been formally recognized by the UN, you know, so they have a seat in the UN. I remember hearing from Elise Boulding that they're doing a certain period of time. I heard this from her about three years ago. Those, those NGOs went from 5,000 to 20,000 in a couple of years. So this is an enormous explosion of this stuff happening. And he referred to it as the planetary immune system. The, 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 you can sort of see how that works. The planet is very sick. It's coming apart on many different levels. It has uh, a chronic fever at this point, which is not going to be fixed right away because – why is it not going to be fixed right away? Because it has a really cozy, fuzzy euphemism. Once you've got a euphemism, you don't need to fix anything. And the euphemism is global warming. You know, it should be called planetary fever or something like that. Although somebody would shortly make that the name of a rock band, I'm sure. So his, his term is planetary immune system that all of these different units are springing up <coughs> to heal the planet in various ways. Okay. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on here very quickly as you know, part of culture in, in the very general sense is people and groups who are opting out of the centralized consumerist economic system. And this also – I once did a little bit of research on this. It would have been much faster if I'd used Wikipedia, but I didn't know about it at that point. Um, this also is happening, mm, I guess you could say spontaneously, though a certain amount of uh, um, imitation and learning goes on and spreading very rapidly. And one of the simple ways that this operates is people getting off the uh, money system. And they just don't issue money and they don't use it, at least within that system that they operate in. They instead – they exchange uh, cr energy credits. Like you need somebody to paint your fence. I mean, here I'm thinking of you know, Amer American fiction. <laughs> Someone needs to paint your fence, you give them a dead rat on a string. <laughs> Something like that, Tom Sawyer kind of thing. But seriously, people come over to your place, they work on it. And you give them a chit. Like, you know, you put in 10 hours work. So, you know, this is worth a certain amount that I can do for you on another occasion. So it's really – it turns out that there is no law that says that you have to use legal tender public and private. It's there for your convenience. But the Treasury Department says, hey, if you want to use pine cones, that's okay with us. <laughs> you know, I'll give you four pine cones for your basket of eggs or whatever as long as you – can agree on how much a pine cone is worth, you'll have a perfectly functional system. And this is happening all over the country and it's not just small isolated units but in some cases whole communities are having at least part of their economic tracking is not being done by currency. And that's kind of handy, isn't it? Because it's harder to tax. <laughs> you, know, you, you owe the government 17 pine cones and one fried egg. <laughs> it's it's going to be kind of hard for them to collect. Um, similar to that and very basic now is to try to reverse the drastic commodification of uh, agriculture. You know, agribusiness has been a disaster for the planet, for small farmers. And when small farmers fail, whole cultures fail with them because, you know, I don't know how many of you grew up on a small farm. I saw one once. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have any in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a very different way of life. You have very different people with very different values. And you have a sense of custodianship and stewardship with the land. If you've lived on it for four generations, you feel its value at a very deep level and you take care of it. You look – it's not so far from your imagination that this could be a living thing. 
that, that you have to keep alive. Um, so there is this experiment now, which was like the last few pages of my book, I touched on it, CSA or Community Supported Agriculture, where people will grow what the community needs, what their uh, customers want. So that gets you away from the gut-wrenching anxiety of being a farmer where you go grow a crop only to find that it suddenly is worthless because everybody else is growing one for the same thing and so on and so forth. Uh, so in community-supported agriculture, you bring people together and they give you their order at the beginning of the season. This season I'm going to take, uh, I don't know, let's say 24 bushels of kale. Let's not be unrealistic at our community. <laughs> We, we basically kale and chard all winter long. I'm surprised we don't become pale green by the time the semester <laughs> is over. But uh, then that's what you plant. And then, you tr and then very often you go on from there to where the customers come and work on the farm. And I, I have spent some time on these operations. They're, they're very nice. There's just much more of a real human bonding with nature. Now, I remember hearing from my spiritual teacher who came here from India. Every now and then he would make some very poignant comment about the absence of animals in this country. You really feel like there's only half a world there. It's like when I go back to New York, I say, where are all the Asian people? What kind of a world is this anyway? So the having that closeness with nature, which it slows you down, it brings you in contact with reality, and so forth. Um, next topic, but should I say anything more about local economies before we move on? Is there anything else I wanted to add to that? Yeah, Matthias? Well, I mentioned a kind of broader trend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, rather than, you know, neoliberal model, let's mm -hmm. plant monocrops and yeah. export everything. Which mm -hmm. You know, the, the basic problem wherever you look seems to be approximately the same. And Socrates actually said this a long time ago. Every human function has a basic function which it serves, and as long as you let it serve that function, it will self-regulate and things will be pretty okay. Nobody will be rich, but everybody will have enough. We should talk a little bit about happiness, too, at some point. <laughs> everybody will be rich. No one will be rich, but everybody will have enough. But what happens is the minute you come and try to use that basic function for something that isn't basic to it, it's going to be – it's going to go awry in some way. So classic example, healthcare. Healthcare is – at the very least to fix people when they get sick. You might also, you know, if you're really smart, you might help them not to get sick, you know, have a healthy life, but we'll let's not go there. That's for, <laughs> that's for philosophers and things like that. But let's say people are getting sick and, and they're having accidents and stuff and you need to have a healthcare system. As long as the system, to the degree that the system is delivering healthcare, it will work fine. It will self-regulate. But the minute someone else steps in and says, aha, People really need this. Therefore, we can charge them for it. It's like you know the waters of the Tigris and the Euphrates and all the rest of it. Uh, in India, for example, where they have a well-developed ancient system of medicine called Ayurveda, which means life science, which is a, a good name for it, there's a special class of physicians called Vaishya Vaidyas, which means poison doctors. In India, there are a lot of serpents, and occasionally these serpents bite people if you get too close to them or step on them or look like something they want to bite. 
And then, in many cases, you have a very limited amount of time to save your life. And if you panic, it's l less because the circulation is faster. And you could not believe how much fear people have in village India about serpents. There's parts of Africa which are just about as bad. But I remember walking on a path with uh, someone who had just come from India and we saw a little snake. Now when I see a snake in the ashram, my first impulse is to grab it and bring it down to the garden because it's the only nonviolent way that we can get rid of gophers. Arguably nonviolent anyway. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are gopher snakes. So I said, oh, look, a snake. I, I regret it to this day. I mean, he shot up in the air about four feet and he was halfway back to the barn but before I said, hey, wait, wait, it's all right. They're not, they're not poisonous. So there's a deep, deeply instinctual fear almost. And so what are you going to do? <laughs> you have a little herb garden where you have antidotes for these poisons. You could charge anything. Someone comes in, man, I've got 10 minutes to live. Get this stuff out of me. You say, ah, you know, I've always liked that elephant of yours. <laughs> you know. So they did a very clever thing. On the cultural level, this is not legalistic. It's not documented. This is a family traditions that go on for generations. They never charge money, anybody, for anything. If you, you make a living at one thing, you're a Vaishya Vaidya for service. So that was a recognition of this basic problem. And I would say anything, even education, if you start doing it for money, immediately you're going to go off the rails and give people what they want and what they will pay for and you won't have education in the proper sense of the word anymore. So – and we're one of the places – I'm finally getting back to your point, Matthias. Thank you for your patience. Your point was that this, is, this has happened to <coughs> agriculture. If you grow a crop to feed someone, be it someone else that you're in a cooperative relationship with – remember Mickey talking about interdependence being a very beautiful thing. If you're growing a crop to, food some, to feed somebody, it will iron out. You know, nobody will get rich off this, but everybody will have enough materially. So then you can go on and live the rest of your life and try to get happiness, which turns out has nothing to do with the amount of money beyond a certain point. However, the minute you start charging people for it, you're going to go into all the difficulties that you mentioned. Monocropping, poisoning the land to make it react faster, and eventually, right here at UC Berkeley, the GMO specter. Shannon, did you want to? Uh -huh. mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's think about that. How does technology get in the way of local groups? I once thought about this in kind of a stepwise process. Okay, you have these human beings who are growing up on this planet, you know, living in these caves, and uh, there's, there's certain dangers and insecurities associated with that. Occasionally it turns out that we've we bought a nice cave and we move in and it turns out that it's already inhabited by a family of cave bears and things like that which suddenly the predator-prey relationship gets reversed. And um, No one is saying that life was easy in the Ice Age. Okay? So it does make sense to invent tools to make the material aspect of life a little bit easier. And I think up to that point – I, for one, would have no objection to technology. I, I'm not the hardest person to satisfy, but I think even a Eugene anarchist who doesn't want to wear a wristwatch or carry a checkbook or anything like that uh, probably would not object to using a forked stick to roast a marshmallow or whatever. Of course, that's a little bit an anachronistic. But, you know, so to use technology to reduce drudgery and increase security so that human beings can go on and discover what their destiny is. Personally, I'd be totally in favor of it and I think probably none of us would have a problem with that. But then the next step is to use the technology to replace human work. 
that gets tricky because, as it turns out, unbeknownst to us consciously, human beings derive their sense of meaning and importance from their work. There was a, there was a study done on, I think, job satisfaction a while back by some uh, well-funded psychologists and they, you know, they rated these, these sort of very few people had job satisfaction. They went and redid the study. It was done in Sweden, I think. They went and redid the study and it turned out that uh, it was mainly about people feeling that there was no meaning in their life. That was, uh, we must have talked about it in the seminar. So, and this is probably why that Sharif and Sharif phenomenon works. When you're working on a joint project with somebody, you are building community with that person on a very deep level because that's where your meaning comes from. So once you start using technology to substitute for work, it, y you're, you're on your way. It's on a slippery slope. You could be making a mistake. Similarly, if you look at communication, uh, so let's say I, f there's, I find out about a terrific – nonviolent insurrection that's going on somewhere in the world <laughs> over the weekend. Well, imagine if I – okay, imagine if I didn't even have a car. Uh, I know one person who could do this by bicycle, but it's not me. Start up in Tomales and bicycle all the way down here to Berkeley and come around to every one of your living units and say, hey, Nubia, I want you to find out about the Maldives. Would you pass the word? <laughs> you know, it, you, obviously, that would not work. Of course, Web is terrific. <laughs> It, it does work rather well so <laughs> for people with whom you cannot communicate in any other way. So if you have the good sense to use it in that category, it has enhanced communication. But the minute you use it to substitute for a more personal form of communication, a letter, a telephone call, God forbid, personal contact, then you're letting the technology replace you as a person. And uh, I, have, I have a slide that I sometimes show, except people have told me it's too depressing. It's, just, it's, it's an ad for a, a brand new bright red sports car which attracted my attention. Okay, I, I admit it. <laughs> Looked at the ad and it shows – it's this oscilloscope readout which is an absolute sync. And the top line says heart rate. That's the, heart, the driver's heart rate in diastolic, histolic, diastolic, histolic. And on the bottom it says it's the uh, engine RPMs and they're absolutely in sync and then they join. It's one beat. And then it says don't just drive the car, be the car. And personally I think this is where we have been driven to this point of letting machines play such a large part in our, in our life that on a certain level we think that we are machines. And that happens to be drastically wrong. Uh, Mike? Uh huh. Yes, he said. Mm -hmm. Man, technology serves human beings. Yes. So this is this is essentially what I'm saying. If you if you use the tool with your intelligence to fulfill a legitimate function. It will not cause any problem. But there will come a point where you'll – human beings have apparently some kind of what they used to call target fascination. There's a thing that happened in World War II. You would you know, go to dive bomb somebody, which you shouldn't be doing in the first place. But you would get so fascinated that you would forget what you were doing and you'd just crash into them. That, that often enough happened that they had a name for the syndrome, target fascination. In the Bhagavad Gita it says whatever you dwell on, you will have a desire for and eventually you will identify with. It's a very profound principle. So to use anything with detachment I imagine would not get us into difficulty. But when you start – when the thing starts dictating its own purposes, then it gets, it gets difficult. So – Oh, yeah, I remember now. This was Shannon's question <laughs> Okay, yeah, about, about technology. So this is clearly part of our task, which is I think the only way we can go about it is to reconnect humanly on such a deep level that machines will be boring. 
which is what they basically are. And even for someone who has a somewhat immature approach like me, even a, f a very, very glitzy machine will look like just a machine. I remember uh, in the early days of computers when they weren't all that glitzy, um, Ishran, who I just mentioned, was being shown a room full of computers and the person showing them to him said, these computers can do everything that you can do. Y that was a mistake. <laughs> Ishran immediately said, they cannot meditate. <laughs> So we have to get away from that fascination with technology, which ultimately is fascination with the material world. And I don't think there's any other way of doing it other than reconnecting with ourselves humanly. And I was very struck by something that Mickey said, uh, connection is the key, reaching for the core of the other person within myself. She said that almost without realizing what she had said the core of the other person within myself. I think I meant to bring that up to her over lunch. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry that we're, this is one of those days where we have a number of little different things to fill in, but we're just you know, trying to sketch in the picture. So there is another conflict-reducing mechanism which interestingly straddles the constructive and obstructive lines that I wanted to bring up here as a possible element in the whole picture of a new culture. <coughs> and that's, again, something which was discovered uh, – oh, sorry. Discovered by serendipity. And when it was discovered that it works very well, it has started to spread. And this, this is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was started in South Africa because you had a situation of appalling dehumanization, absolutely appalling, one of the worst in the world, up to that time anyway. And it had been voted out of power. And uh, at that time, people were saying that if South Africa could solve its problem, the whole continent would be solvable, and I, I think in theory that that's still true. But they discovered that once they had changed the power structure, that had did very little to change the human dynamic on the ground. So, I mean, for us, this is no big surprise, right? But they had to discover that experientially. And um, it, was a, it was a revolution that came about through largely nonviolent means. It had gone through several phases, went from nonviolent, relapsed into violence after the Sharpeville massacre in 1960. But by the time Mandela was released, he was able to get it back on a nonviolent track. And it was mainly done through boycotts and things like that. So the basis was there. And there had to be a way of bringing those two communities together. And you know, there's more than two communities in South Africa. But for convenience, we'll say Europeans and Africans. And uh, the, the dehumanization had been drastic. And you needed some way of bringing them back together. What they came up with was basically a kind of victim offender reconciliation program on the large scale political level. Okay. Okay, if you have to go, Carrie, I won't say anything intelligent after this. <laughs> um, and the system was pretty simple. And interestingly, the, uh, incidentally, there's an interesting film about this called Long Night's Journey Into Day. It's a very moving film. And um, what they did was they allowed people to publicly admit their crimes and they would then be uh, pardoned. Yeah. So what all you had to do was get up and say, yes, I did it. And that it was amazingly helpful in many ways. I mean, you had mothers who had no idea what had happened to their children, to their sons. And here you have somebody who had been a police captain. And he would say, yeah, we, we lured those children into a combi and drove it off into the country and blew it up. So it's not like you're giving them a whole lot, right? But at least they can go to the spot where their child died 
and at least somebody got up and said, yes, something happened to you. But, you know, it's very minimal, right? They're not saying – they're not even saying, I did it and I'm sorry in many cases. All I had to do was say I did it. Um, and in fact, I, in some of the scenes in this movie, you'll see on both sides, black and white people saying, yes, I participated in this crime. That's what it seemed like we should be doing in those days. Here's why. And not even really expressing any remorse. Uh, hang on just one second. And so then um, this enabled them to get the country functioning together enough that it could write a constitution and start moving forward. And in some ways, it's been very encouraging and very inspiring even and progressive. I remember hearing from a famous um, Jewish, white, South African who was a lawyer and he actually had been bombed in his car and lost, uh, lost one arm. And he's now on the Supreme Court in South Africa and he's saying, we are writing pro-human rights decisions every day of the week in that court. Uh, it used to be that the United States, South Africa, and China were executing more people than any other industrialized country in the world and South Africa dropped out, leaving us neck and neck with China for that signal honor. So in some ways it has been very, very successful I and it was uh, imitated or uh, re replicated in Guatemala and in the Balkans and in many other parts of the world with certain variations matching local conditions and certain variations just because, you know, that thing also was not perfect and we need to have a look at improving it. So let's take your comment and then I want to ask everyone how could you improve this system? What yeah. Was the defense? Uh, if court, it was in courtroom. They would do it in – it would be public and uh, a lot of it was televised and so forth. But it was oral. People would volunteer themselves? Yeah, because at this point you were now a criminal. I, if you – okay, I, there's one element I forgot to mention. It had to be a political crime. You know, if you robbed somebody or, you know, you killed them just because you were in a bad mood, uh, you still were criminal and criminally liable. But if you killed someone or whatever you did in a political context, you could get pardon for that by public admission. So, so that's the truth part of reconciliation. Okay, so given what we all know and in fact some of the stuff that we've considered here today, what else do you think might be done? Uh -huh. I don't see how the reconciliation Well, okay. This, uh, as, as I've already been mentioning, uh, there is, for example, in the film, there's this very poignant episode where uh, a white South African, his wife was killed in a movie theater. These four guys just burst into the theater and started machine gunning people. And all the four people who did it were caught and they're sitting there absolutely impassive. And this guy is just trying to get them to say, did you notice a woman in a white raincoat while you were shooting? That's all he wanted them to say. And they were just looking at him. They didn't say anything. They were, they were just doing the minimum. They admitted, yes, you caught us. We committed that act, period, end of quote. So I guess what I'm saying, it's amazing how well it worked uh, on this very, very minimal admission. But think of how much more there is to do. Of, uh, I can think of a case where there was a uh, – in one second, there was a case of a woman, uh, a black woman in the South. I think it may have been Florida. Her son was lynched by two white boys. This is in my book. And uh, in court, one of those boys broke down and said to the woman, I, I just hope that someday you find it in your heart to forgive me. And she said, son, I've already forgiven you. That's where we want to get to. And inf incidentally, the reason that I'm talking about the TRC system is because up to a point it has the wherewithal for being principled nonviolence because forgiveness is very hard. Ask Arby who's, who's working on stuff like this. If you can bring, it, bring yourself to forgive someone who has wronged you in a very serious way, 
really dehumanized you. You've done emotionally what you need to do to engage principled nonviolence. So the question that I'm proposing that we consider is, okay, most of the time in this course we're talking about people who got the structure and the behaviors without the emotional energy. So here it looks like here's a case where we mostly have the emotional energy. We've got people to do this. And, we can, and incidentally, there are systems that do it a lot better and they're mostly indigenous ones like the Gachacha court systems in sub-Saharan Africa that do this a lot better. But I'm just saying in these cases where it seems to be intersecting with the industrialized world, we have people who have gone through the spiritual conversion that you need to do to furnish the good energy to run the nonviolent machine. But they haven't thought a lot about how to build the machine, you know, put the filters in, how to gear it up and make it work. There I go again, dehumanizing everything. Okay, so I think it was Matt, Seishi, and Paolo. Um, it was in uh, Chile after Jorge yeah. was deposed uh, in the early 90s. Um, yeah, that's another place. Yeah, there are different uh, presidential commissions yeah. set up, but, um, but the military still had a very strong role in yeah. controlling the politics in the country. Yeah. So it wasn't until uh, later into the 90s, different presidents set up different yeah. uh, commissions based in part on yeah. Disappearances. So that you know, families could know what happened. And yeah. So there were around uh, 3,000 people who just sort of disappeared in Chile. And um, because it was very centralized in Chile, as opposed to Argentina, there were a yeah. number of various generals who were carrying out the work in Chile. It was very centralized, so they had the records. And so mm -hmm. the generals ended up coming forward and yeah. you know, kind of publicly, you know, letting yeah. people know, like, yeah. you know, what happened to yeah. you know, various people who disappeared. And then later on, By that time, a lot of the uh, people like Pinochet had appointed who were in government mm -hmm. and, and started retiring or like yeah. people who set up a commission where um, whoever like was kidnapped and tortured or mm -hmm. um, other like political prisoners, they could come forward and tell their story. Uh -huh. And then the commission like officially would recognize these people and uh -huh. between about 25,000 or 30,000 mm -hmm. of these uh, political prisoners and everyone got yeah. And, and a lot of those, you know, the top on campus last semester said it was really like an affirming thing in Chilean society. Yeah. That people would, you know, tell their numbers to other yeah. people. That was like part of their identity. Yeah, it's like people showing their uh, stenciled on numbers from the Holocaust. And, and, um, and one of the people was Michelle Bachelet, who's now yeah. the president, the first yeah. female president of Chile. And yeah. so just now having her as president, which is really yeah. Yeah. Reconciliation, yeah. Commission even further to have um, the military people meet with yeah. the So that really is like victim offender reconciliation. It finally worked its way up to that situation through several stages that were not sufficient. And the issue often was that all over Latin America, the issue was having <laughs> to choose between justice and reconciliation because the army that had carried this stuff out, th the time that they did it, they, th they had convinced themselves and everybody told them and paid them and patted them on the back for defending the country against communism or whatever it is. And then suddenly to turn around and say, okay, you have risked your life doing this horrible stuff and now we're going to blame you for it. That was unacceptable to them and they still had enough power to not go along with it. So the people who had been victimized and the public in general who sympathized with them needed to renounce the uh, revenge, uh, the accounting. They needed to renounce the calling these people to account in order to get the stories out into the public. That often was it. So that was a uh, that is a real spiritual uh, renunciation that people had to make. Okay, I am in a position where I could blame you for what you've done to my family or my people or whatever, and I'm not going to do that so that we can get back together. What else is integrative power? That, that, and it's interesting how they went step by step towards uh, building up to this. The one thing is mm -hmm. uh, now in the Justice Department, because the Supreme Court justices that Pinochet 
say, uh, appointed uh, mm -hmm. that's been in over 15 years. And mm -hmm. left office that a lot of them are retiring, a lot of these judges. And so yeah. now there's actually a lot of like civil suits filed against these military yeah. people for yeah. know, ostensible. Yeah. Well, as I think I've mentioned, um, we had a chairman of Peace and Conflict Studies at one time who had been in the state Supreme Court and he had actually gone down to Argentina and Chile and while the torturing was still going on and he was famous enough to make public statements and bring attention to it. He was an incredibly courageous guy. He said we should renounce uh, punitive measures altogether uh, and well, the only thing we could do is – is reparations. You know, if people have, you know, bombed a, a billion dollars out of your country, they have to pay a billion dollars. Or if they've stolen it, they have to give it back as you would in any civil arrangement. But holding this threat of punishment over people is extremely limited usefulness. Usually it backfires. Uh, just a second, are we? Seishin? Do you mind if I repeat what you're saying? Because I, otherwise it doesn't get onto oh. the camera. No, 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 no. I'm going to repeat it, Seishi, so that it gets onto the camera. Oh, okay. What uh, Seishi is saying is that in African countries, the most important thing is that when there's been an offense, to get the people at least to talk. Go ahead. This is a very – yeah, very interesting point. So the commission becomes a third party and where people cannot talk directly to one another and can't really reconcile on the level of relationship, at least – and this is a big at least – at least they get this crime out of their system the bu the w and the victims get the, this, the anger and the grief and the resentment to some degree out of their system by being able to talk to someone in a structured relationship where it has some connection with the other party. So in a way to add that you are doing duty to free free people's crimes. Yes. Yeah. So you have it done. Yeah. And at that point you should not be so bad. Yeah. You know that the victim is not free mm -hmm. when you are committing that crime. Yeah. And of course the person who has been victim by maybe you know what he has done. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, during the act of violence, something happens to us and we don't feel what we're doing and you create a situation where they can suddenly feel what they had done but not in a way that's going to devastate them and it's very moving to see them crying uh, when this happens and that sends a message to the victim that an acknowledgement that you, you realize what you've done. Incidentally, this has been tried in two, three different ways around the Balkan countries also. And one of the uh, tricks that they've come up – that's not a good word. One of the methods that they've come up with to get the conversation going is – or the same thing with Israeli kids and Palestinian kids. You can come here and say what has been done to you. You cannot say, this is what you did to me, <coughs> right? This is not going to personalize the crime, not going to point a finger or blame. And, you know, this is our old thing. You're against the thing, not the person. You can, you can bear your heart about all the evils that happened to you as long as you don't suddenly turn and say, you <coughs> did this to me. It's that person who did it to you. It's his responsibility to own it, to step forward and say, yes, this happened to me. I was caught up in this and such and such happened. Yeah. Okay, Paolo and then Arby.
Okay. Yeah. Hang on one second. I just want to repeat what Cal is saying. That there's, there's an issue here that's been as successful in some African countries of not just reconciling the victim and the offender, which we've been talking about, but to heal the whole community, bring everybody back together around it. Because we started off by saying that one of the differences between our retributive system and a hoped for restorative system is that in the retributive system, the state owns the crime. So, but we're now going about it the other way. The, the individuals own the crime, but the community has to come in on the reconciliation. Go ahead. And trying to answer the question that you posted a few minutes ago on uh -huh. wha what is missing. Yeah, what's missing? In the PRC, wha what is always wondering is what happens after. Is there any follow up? And interestingly, for most people, I like to focus more on the perpetrator. Yeah. Yes. And be productive instead of, yeah. oh no, they are bad and let's yeah. ignore them. Yeah. So I well, always wonder, that's a great way of trying to get them back, but yeah. what else? Okay, well, so you're bringing my question back to me. What else, uh, what can we do? Did, does anybody spot it on the basis of what we've been saying here so far today? It's very dramatic because we have like 15 seconds. Uh, it, yeah. Uh -huh. to have to the uh, perpetrator the perpetrator to have to make a healing process because yeah uh, you told the victim what he done yeah most of the time he says he or she says okay he died it's true that if you don't you know show uh -huh. you know any emotion about what he done yeah and you don't feel like uh, you uh -huh. want to It won't happen, yeah. yeah. But if the, the, the perpetrator wants to bring in a reconciliation and show, mm -hmm. after you, you, you say everything, the victim, yeah. the victim is ready to accept yeah. So if I could paraphrase what you're saying, like the, oddly enough, though it shouldn't be so strange to us, the victim has less of a problem than the perpetrator. This is perpetration-induced traumatic stress all over again. If you get the perpetrator healed and reconciled with the community, is going to be harder than helping the victim. In most cases, I mean, sometimes the, the crime can be so horrific that it's traumatizing for life. But okay, in the last, no, 10 seconds ago, it was all over. But I have to say, think of the Sharif and Sharif experiment. To get people to do something together, build something together, if ne possibly even physical. I remember being in Atlanta one time and your four kids had burned down a black church. And they were uh, charged with the judge of rebuilding that church. So feeling it is the good first step, but then you have to actually put it in practice in some way, I think, to cement it. Okay, have a good weekend, everybody.